thank you very much. And I'm going to talk to you today about two truths of innovation. Uh, but before I do, I want to talk a little bit about what is innovation. And I would think I'm going to start with what is not innovation. It is not just a creative idea. Innovation, rather, is the intersection of invention and insight that leads to social and economic value. So it's not an invention or idea that, has, that no one uses. It's something that adds value to society. So why is innovation important? Well, obviously, I think we all understand that our country's economic success from our very beginnings has been built on innovation and our ability to create revolutionary new products and processes. But that <clears throat> innovative nature of our country is being challenged globally. In 1963, US inventors held 81% of the patents in this country. In 2007, for the very first time, foreign inventors held more patents than US inventors. Clearly, we are in a global race to innovate, and our future success as a country is going to be based on our ability to continue to innovate faster in other parts of the world. So about a decade ago, about 12 years ago, I became very interested in how does innovation happen. And I started working with a cognitive scientist, Christian Shun at the University of Pittsburgh. And over a period of about six or seven years, we got numerous grants from the National Science Foundation and other foundations to study how design teams innovate. So what we did is we studied both on corporate design teams and student design teams. Uh, we took an international company uh, from Europe that was a medical products innovator. They'd won innovation awards internationally. They were considered to be the best in their field. And we studied four or five of their design team members over a period of four to five months. We also studied dozens of design teams, student design teams, in a product realization course, which I taught, where students would go from a concept to a prototype during a semester. Now, what we did in, uh, for all these design teams, we actually video, videotaped every meeting that they had when they were working on the design. Um, we looked at literally thousands of segments of data, uh, video data, that we were able to analyze and code to see when innovations occurred and why they occurred and what led to those innovations. We learned a lot, things that we never expected to come out of the study. Uh, the two truths I'm going to talk about are directly, we found, to be true throughout the innovation process. The first truth is that innovators had the greater aptitude for utilizing analogies in the design process. Now, analogy is a cognitive process of taking knowledge from one subject area and applying it to another area. And taking it a step deeper, we found there were two different types of analogies that we saw when innovations occurred within the design teams, both at the corporate and at the student levels. The first was a within-domain analogy, and this is akin to <coughs> designing, learning something from the design of an IV bag and applying it to a product for balloon angioplasty. So it was within the domain. So we found the innovations that occurred in a very relevant way were incremental in nature, so they were incremental innovations. The second type of analogy that we saw were between-domain analogies. Now, these are analogies that occurred from one field to a very disparate other field, uh, taking knowledge that, that was learned. Uh, there's a great example of this. Uh, George Mastrel, if you're not familiar with George, he was an engineer um, back in the 40s and 50s. And he went out, in the, uh, went out hunting with his dog. And sure enough, his dog got cockleburrs caught in his fur. And he was curious, well, how come they stick so well to this fur? And so he actually pulled the cockleburrs and looked underneath a microscope and saw thousands of tiny hooks that would attach to anything that had a loop, such as hair, fur, or clothing. And what did this lead to? Well, as an engineer, he knew nothing about textiles, but he developed Velcro. And Velcro, as many of you know, has transformed the textile industry. It has eliminated the need, in many cases, for buttons and zippers. Now, this highlights what happens in between domain analogies. What we found in our research is between domain analogies are much more transformational and lead to disruptive technologies, particularly in specific markets. So the second truth that we learned is that the disruptive innovations, ones that totally transform a space, are more likely when team members cross disciplinary boundaries and often enter domains that are totally new and often uncomfortable to them. Because when this happens, 
when you have team members from disparate groups getting together and they enter each other's domains, they question commonly accepted, accepted paradigms within that new discipline. So things, when you get tunnel vision working in a certain area, you never question the, the general paradigms you're operating under. But if somebody new comes in, suddenly they'll question why you're doing things a certain way. It'll really change uh, the way. So you can have some revolutionary new ideas or thinking that might come about. So this is where the idea of getting art and engineering work together becomes so critically important. Over my career, I found the team, design teams of engineers compared to art and engineering teams working together function much differently. And <clears throat> this, I want to highlight this with the fact that uh, when I was in Pittsburgh, I taught the product realization course. At the same time, a professor, a good friend of mine, John Kagan at Carnegie Mellon University, taught the same course. I was working with all engineers whereas John was working with art students and engineering students. Uh, sure, the students that I was working with did a great job of meeting the requirements of the products that they were creating, but they were very incrementally innovative in nature, whereas John's students, where the arts engineering were together, the solutions they came up with were more creative and were more likely to have transformational innovations occurring because they were working across the domain disciplines. So when I came to uh, UWM, and I started the product realization course, I was so excited to have the Peck School of the Arts because I was able to bring art students and engineering students together in my course. And we've had tremendous success doing this. We've had so many success stories. And I want to talk briefly just about one, a Clever Blocks team, uh, which uh, uh, is on our campus and they've worked in the product realization course. Uh, but they essentially have come up with a new interface for computer aid design where you actually can stack blocks together and whatever you stack together becomes an image on your screen, a 3D, a 3D rendering. Now this team doesn't, it not only has engineering and art students, but it has an architecture students and a political science major. So it is truly the number of disciplines has just been remarkable. And you'll probably hear more about this later in another talk, but this team has one of the winners of our st uh, student startup challenges on our campus, and I'm so excited about the future of what this is going to become. Uh, finally, one of the things I've come about uh, since coming to UDM, particularly becoming chancellor, is understanding that at universities, there's different types of innovation. Uh, being an engineer by training, I'm, I've always had a strong understanding about how universities can technologically innovate and bring new products and processes to society to add value. What I've become equally aware of is that universities can socially innovate. They can do things that impact society in, in unique ways that may not have anything to do with a specific product or process. Uh, I want to highlight this with someone on our campus by the name of Ann Bastings. Now, Ann is on our theater arts program. She actually is training in a playwright. And for some reason, she had an interest in studying aging or gerontology, so two completely disparate fields. And she began utilizing her training and her work in playwriting to impact Alzheimer's patients or the, or the aging. And I want to show a brief video to show you what the impact of her actually moving to a completely new field has done to that field. Hi, Paul. This is your first time. Hey, Pat. Are you going to be okay with everyone here? Time Slips is really pretty simple. It's improvisational storytelling. So we're going to write a story today. Are you up for it? Okay. There is no course, set course for the story. It all comes from the participants themselves. To start off, can you tell me what's going on in this picture? Yeah. They're hugging. It's a radical shift for people with memory loss because our first impulse is to actually go right to memory to try to heal the person. Why do you think they're happy? Because it's their wedding anniversary. <gasps> it's their wedding anniversary. And this is particularly powerful for people whose ability to control language is fraying. So it's giving them back that tool to connect with people again. He has decided that from now on, the next 50 years, I'm going to be the boss. Okay. <laughs> All right. The first moment I realized that something was unique about this method, um, it was actually kind of a moment of desperation. I had been trying all these memory-based techniques and they weren't working. And so I just tore a picture of the Marlboro Man out of a magazine and I had a big sketch pad like this. And I said, say anything you want. Let's make up a story. He thinks, he thinks. underline, he thinks he's gonna be the boss. The, the second I figured out that that worked, 
that's all I did for the next 12 weeks. I just did the same thing over and over and over again just to see if I could recreate that. And in some ways, I'm doing that 12 years later. And in fact, it works every time, <laughs> I'm here to say. <laughs> Anne is one of those uh, creative visionaries. Sometimes Anne will come to me with an idea and I have absolutely no idea what she's talking about. <laughs> and just have gotten to the point of saying, fine, okay, because I know it's gonna be great. I just know it's gonna be great. Sometimes yeah, the memory doesn't rough. come yeah. as yeah. easily, right? Yeah. So yeah. you feel comfortable kind of sharing yeah. whatever, whichever way it comes yeah. out. I mean, Anne is absolutely a star in this community, but she's also a star nationally and internationally. You know the magic of this is that there's no planning. No. I think it's her enthusiasm and her ideas and her belief that we should have high expectations of the imagination and the creative spirit of people with dementia. She's always pushing us in a good way to think bigger and to think something that can really revolutionize and reinvent long-term care. It's not up to me, no. yeah. it's your story. I think UWM for me, the most important thing about working there is this feeling that you can make it happen. I have a career of working in the cracks, of in between things, in between departments, in between disciplines, in between university community. And the, it's a really ripe community for making those kind of things happen, those kind of projects happen, those collaborations. And it's a place that has a need for it too. So um, there's an enthusiasm for that kind of work and an acceptance for it and, and open doors, frankly. So how are we gonna end our story? I think I love what I do because it allows you to tap almost immediately into the essence of humanity. Bernie says, when does my control start? And Julianne says, that's yeah, what you think. think. Sitting in on the story today, there's still moments of magic. Hallelujah, thank you God. Anne actually goes in and works with Alzheimer patients and crevs them create a story. She gives them some pictures and the level of communication and the level of creativity that they have shown far exceeds anything else that is uh, happening throughout the country and around the world. And she's essentially defined her own field by finding the niche between her playwriting and her work uh, with uh, Alzheimer's patients. Clearly, she's crossed disciplinary boundaries She's made a paradigm shift in the way that she has done things and clearly is an innovator. So thank you very much. <laughs>